How's it going YouTube? Come at you today with another video and today guys with the brain deals we're to hand trap post Fota and Hypernova. There's a lot of new cards coming into the game, a lot of new interactions and a lot of new places to know where to hand trap. So I'm very excited to bring you this video today and I hope that everyone's ready because there's a lot to talk about. So if you haven't already checked out my sponsors over at Imperium Duelist, Dragon Shield or Gem, definitely go ahead and do so all down in the description below. Then also if you haven't heard, when I hit 16,000 subscribers I'll be giving away the Player's Choice Collaboration Spellground. Very excited to give that away too so definitely go ahead and subscribe the channel without further ado let's hop right on into the first deck so the first deck that i'm going to cover today is going to be gishki sprite this is a deck that was really popular in the ocg and now tribe get sprites the clear best deck out of the sprite variants um tier is still the best deck but tri sprite is still the second best at the moment so definitely doing a lot of work right now but i think in the tcg tribe get sprite and gishki sprite really are going to fall flat i don't think that they're going to be super great i think that we're going to see a lot of bestial sprite pure sprite in some variation or even bestial sprite being really solid too and then we're getting a lot of new bestial support too so that's pretty crazy but looking at gishki sprite alone i think that there's a lot of applications that make this deck really cool i do think that there's a lot of things that really do conflict because if you don't start with your gishki engine then you're not able to summon out your ritual once you use gigantic or starter so there's a lot of things that can conflict so if you do start with your gishki engine you're realistically just trying to put up the monster negation which the ritual allows you to negate a monster effect shuffle it back into the deck and then return the ritual to your hand so there is a trap to resummon the ritual as well which is pretty cool but i do think that the deck does have a lot of issues but at the same point if you are in a grind game with this deck they definitely can have a lot of advantage very quickly but there's a lot of really key ways you can stop this deck so if you see gishki abyss in the graveyard you typically don't want to stop it on the first summon so if they just go normal abyss you don't want to ash valor in from that it just won't really do you any good it's only adding a gishki with a thousand or less defense so vision or shadow to add a ritual spell or ritual monster which doesn't really accomplish a lot in the grand scheme of like the sprite engine so if you're really okay with just seeing like a monster negation on the board then this is perfectly fine but besides that if you see the abyss in the graveyard just to prevent this from being looped go ahead and just crow this out of the grave so you don't have to keep seeing it hit the board multiple times because the effect is just on summon but if you look in the right here next to gigantic you'll see the gishki grim this card is essentially deep sea diva and it's definitely the one that you want to go ahead and valor or imperm but if your opponent is going second with this deck sometimes you just don't want to valor or imperm the grim because what the grim does is summon the abyss from the deck but then it locks your opponent into only attacking with ritual monsters so if you're at 8,000, if you don't valor or imperm this you're more than likely getting another turn so there is a 50 50 on that because you let them get to the abyss and then you have to deal with the abyss of course at some point so they can't just like loop a ton of materials but at the same time like they're trying to play through a board and then they have to deal with the fact that like they can't attack with anything except the ritual so this is something where i would say if you don't go ahead and hit the grim and you just start letting things resolve and you have like imperm just save the imperm for the gigantic at that point or even the valor um there's probably just a better spot i would say being that gigantic or even like a good time elf effect being negated i would say would be more impactful than hitting the grim at that point but if you do go ahead and hit the grim it's also pretty impactful because again you shut your opponent off of getting the abyss and the only other way that they're realistically getting to it is if they go ahead and like maybe sprint send or if they go and summon it with like the gigantic but again at that point they can't summon the ritual monster so definitely a few things that do conflict here so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind ashing starter is always just going to be correct out of sprite because if you interact with the first summon and then they have to go ahead and get another two on the board it just gets increasingly harder when you have ash for the starter and then of course just belling the elf this is also true just against the pure variant because you want to make sure that in the builds that play the double swap frog that you're not allowing your opponent to summon back that swap frog and make a totally awesome again with double cross you really don't want to have to play through two or three toads which is always going to be really tough so this is definitely just always going to be the correct thing to bell um there's a lot of situations where i'll just put in bell to make sure that i don't have to play against a toad and then you can go ahead and just stop the elf and that's just definitely enough to go ahead and break the board in the follow-up turn and really be able to make the plays you need to win the game so i would say these are all very important interactions here definitely remember the thing about grim though locking you into the ritual monsters attacks only uh which is always going to be very important here uh, moving on though we do have the Makanko Liberomancer and this deck is really interesting too and this is something that can really catch 
too off guard. Libromancer was always one of those decks that had a really hard time with Nibiru, but in a time where you're not really playing against too many hand traps, this is a deck that can really go off. With the Makanko cards, though, there's definitely quite a bit to note here. So just to start off with the Zolde, if you have Valor or Imperm, I definitely recommend going ahead and just negating the Zolde. The whole objective of this is to send the Inviting Rondo or whichever equip spell that they need, and then they'll summon the Renaud from deck. It's the level one Infernoble that allows you to add back an equip spell. And so at that point, what you can do is go ahead and add back the equip spell, which will then allow you to bounce the Renaud back to your hand and then summon a Makanko from the deck. And then you can keep on extending that way because the Makanko that you summon is going to go ahead and add you another equip spell. So there's so many different things that Azolde allows you to do because then you can and re-summon Renaud and get to Herald the Arclight and then go ahead and get a search for a ritual or a spell. So there's just so much that this leads to that you want to go ahead and Imperm or Valor. The Zolde is going to be very important. I do think out of Libromancer though, the most important card that you have to stop is going to be the first appearance, which is the field spell. The field spell does activate to ritual summon. So going ahead and using Ogre on this is very important. And then also if you have an Ash, you definitely want to Ash the Geek Boy. Uh, if they start with Fire, you typically just want to make sure that you are ashing the geek boy the fire is pretty good but i always would say to make sure that your opponent cannot get to the first appearance it's very important for the deck to get that level six ritual out so you really want to make sure that you are cutting off the access to first appearance as much as possible so the ogre on first appearance or just ash and geek boy is just usually correct and then also the ritual of makanko allows you to go ahead and equip an equip spell from your grave which is really important because inviting rondo which is the one on the screen here is actually just a snatch deal and it's a pretty broken interaction so whatever equip spell that they're going after with the ritual you want to go ahead and crow to make sure that it doesn't hit the board and then also i do just want to say droll against this deck is pretty insane it's also pretty insane against gishki sprite too so just kind of keep that in mind there are going to be a lot of blanket effects that are really good this format against gishki sprite i don't really think that nibiru is that good i think droll is really solid against this deck nibiru and droll are both very solid cards the last interaction i want to talk about in this deck is going to be bell on preparation of rights of course prep is just an insane card bell just gets you a lot of value in many situations against many decks and this is definitely one that bell is very good for so keep that in mind if you are playing bell because i think that is just one of the probably the top four hand traps that we have for your next format um, Tri Brigade Sprite though I do just want to mention this build as well just because it is pretty popular a lot of people have been testing it out and I do see it at a tournament here and there um, Bell Revolt of course we already know this one this is very important to make sure that you have the interaction to stop the omen from coming out Ghost Ogre on Appaloosa. I cannot stress this enough. If Appaloosa is in the format, you really have to know that Appaloosa has to lose attack for it to be able to negate. So you have to use Ogre whenever they go ahead and try to negate with the Appaloosa. And then the Appaloosa will end up going to the graveyard without having a negation. That's very important. So the next thing too is going to be the Ash on Starter more importantly. But if your opponent does have like a carrot that they summon and then they summon blue after that typically i'll go ahead and just ash the blue at that point because i'm gonna try and make my opponent have to extend as much as possible to get to a jet um you can also go ahead and go after like the gigantic with the ash if you really want to just cut off the access to other parts of their engine but ashing the blue is sometimes just correct because you cut off a line to a lot of different cards but ashing starter of course if you have the interaction for the first monster you just always hold the ash for the starter because that's the only other way that they're getting a two on the board of course if they have like swap frog and angler that's another thing but for the most part if you get rid of the first monster and all they have a starter they're just going to pass turn after you ash starter the last thing is that you want to go ahead here and just Valor or Imperm the first name that hits the board to go ahead and try to summon from the extra deck. That's still going to be very important. Or if you see the Gigantic coming out a little earlier and you feel like your opponent doesn't really have the advantage, let's say they just went normal special into Gigantic, then this is definitely the spot where you want to go ahead and Valor or Imperm the Gigantic because this is just going to lead them to get into things like Kit. And that's just going to spiral out of control into combo. So you definitely just want to go ahead and shut this off as soon as possible. So if you see the name come out first, definitely go ahead and Imperm the the name or if you see the gigantic come out first then you go ahead and just imperm that instead uh, both very important interactions just got to make sure that you're paying attention to the game state and just kind of seeing what your opponent could have and then making sure that you're using your imperm in a really meaningful spot here 
So the next one I want to go over is Fluanderies. This one's going to be rather brief. We know Fluanderies. It's the deck that's really annoying to play against. It is what it is, right? But if you have Ghost Ogre from map, it's going to be very impactful. Getting rid of map, of course, is just such a good interaction. I always just save Ash for Prosperity or whichever pot card that they're playing. Typically, it's going to be Prosperity. Sometimes you'll see Extravagance, but for the most part, you just Ash Prosperity. This is just such a big one. If your opponent has realistically nothing and they open up their turn with like Ash, Advent and then they banish a monster then I'm always just ashing that because clearly your opponent just needs a way to play the game and that's going to be the most impactful interaction there and then always just Imperm or Valor on the Eglin this is just normally correct you want to make sure that your opponent doesn't get to things like Empen it's definitely going to be a really important play here uh, but just kind of moving past Flounderies of course we already know how to play against the deck for the most part but I do want to make sure that for anyone who doesn't that we do include it um, Plunder Patrol though Plunder Patrol is a really insane deck it's my favorite rogue deck if i'm not playing tier or striker i'm probably playing plunder honestly i think this deck's really cool um they did just get a new synchro this card is insane and this deck is relatively cheap outside of the brave engine the enchantresses are like ten dollars the rights are like forty dollars so not super terrible but this deck alone is very good the new synchro is pretty insane Definitely imperm that because you're going to get a token on your board anyway. So you want to make sure that you have the imperm ready because it actually hurts pretty bad now if you go for the combo with the new ship and then you just get impermed because this is a way that you can go ahead and summon a light to your opponent's board, make lists, and then resummon the Blackbeard to really net a lot of advantage. So imperming the new one is really important. Uh, Ash on any of the ships is really important too. This is something that a lot of people just miss, but do not Ash the Whitebeard. Do not Ash anything else. Just Ash the extra deck monster's effect on the board. So if they go like Moark Banish, you can Ash that. If they go List in the Gate, you can Ash that. That's really important. Just save Ash for the extra deck monster. I promise you it'll go a really long way. The other thing is going to be belling the Plunder Patrol booty. This card is just one thing that allows you to go ahead and change the attribute of an opponent's monster, then special in a monster from your graveyard. A lot of really good playability in the deck is something that really does allow you to recur your resources because you can also target a card in your graveyard and just shuffle it back to your deck. So let's say that you're out of Moark, so you can just recycle a Moark, which is really nice too. And then if you have Ogre, definitely just go ahead and Ogre the Shipyard. This one's also going to be very important. If your opponent has like Fateful Adventure on the board, you can just just go ahead and hit that that's always gonna be a really nice interaction too but if your opponent goes uh shipyard and they pitch one and then you ogre and it's not like whitebeard that they pitched then of course they're going to be down in card advantage pretty hard so that's something that you really want to keep in mind as well but this deck is very good and it can definitely catch you off guard this deck just won a regional i think a couple weeks ago because it's still really good even right now so something that you should really keep in mind as you're looking for a new deck for the new format plunder patrol is realistically one that you should be looking at to pick up but moving on to the next deck here, we have Tier Limit. Tier Limit is the deck that has just been insane for the format. So I really want to make sure that you understand where the deck is going and really what it's going to be doing in the new format. So Bistros on any of the names, of course, is going to be really impactful. But a lot of people are going to be playing Tasking and Meta Noise. In both cards, you can Ash. So definitely keep that in mind. If you go to interact with your opponent that you have some way to shut down like a tasking. And then if your opponent has meta noise, of course, that card's insane. The Book of Moon and the Free Foolish Burial is just a really solid card that you can ash. If you're playing your turn and it's turn zero and your opponent has Hobness, definitely just ashing that 100% of the time. But if your opponent is trying to combo off, I'm usually just saving Ash for Shiren because that's going to be the best one to ash here. It's just something that can really stop your opponent from pitching a Kelbeck or an Agito and popping off really crazy. So Ash on Shiren, typically if my opponent's starting, if I'm playing, I'm just Ashing Hobness. But if you're in a grind game and you have like two Ash or you just get an Ash a later game and then the Shiren and the Hobness don't really matter, then having Ash for things like Meta Noise or Tasking is also very good. Looking at Kekalos though, Imperm, Valor, and then Bell on the effect to go ahead and summon a monster and get rid of Kit is also very good because at that point, your opponent can't summon that Merly. They can't get to multiple mills. Bell on Kit effect is actually really underrated, but Valor or Imperm, always on Kekalos. <laughs> always, always, always. Really solid interaction here. Uh, moving away from tier, we have Kashtira. Now, this is one that I really want to spend some time on because Kashtira is going to be a deck that we're definitely going to have to deal with next format. So the first thing that I want to mention is that tier limits Kashtira can get belled. So that's something that's really important too. I would say to just Ash the Field Spell. 
Now, this is just a Rota, and I think it's just the best thing to Ash. So the reason being is because if you Ash like Unicorn, it's okay. Or even if you Ash like Papaya, because like you're still getting a card ripped out of your extra deck. And then even if they just go Unicorn Pass, you're not getting over 2,500 without really putting monsters on the board. So at that point, it just becomes really rough if your opponent gets to rip another card. And then if you have like two kit in your extra deck and they rip both kit. So I think that you should just Ash the Field Spell because typically that's the first thing that's going down. So just getting rid of the Rota immediately is going to be the most important. But the most important interaction is actually a huge 50-50 right now. And I'm going to explain both sides of it and let you make your own decision on which one you think is going to be more correct. So in my opinion, I think that Unicorn is like Eglin. Because you could have things like Map, you could have things like Advent. And there's so many different cards that you could just have that make cards like Imperm or Valor not matter against the Wanderies, right? Unicorn's kind of the same way. Because if your opponent already opened up Papaya, if they already opened up Rise Heart, there's a couple different things that just make the Imperm or Valor on Unicorn feel lackluster. But it's the same thing. If your opponent does not already have those cards to tag out their Eglin, they don't have those cards to really be able to dodge any kind of Valor or Imperm or extend. Imperm or Valor on Unicorn is insane. You don't allow your opponent to get to a Papaya or Birth, which is really important because both of those cards are insane. And then also, you just really don't allow your opponent to extend super far too, which is really nice. And sometimes it can literally just be like negate the Unicorn and then, especially if it's against Pure, they're not really doing much else unless they already opened up cards like Rise Heart. So it really does depend. It's kind of like playing against Fluanderies. You're either going to stop the Unicorn and they're going to pass, or you're going to stop the Unicorn and they're just going to activate Papaya. The other side of the coin is that you wait for a Rise Heart. So Rise Heart is really cool of an interaction point here because your opponent's going to go Unicorn, Papaya, summon Fenrir, add Rise Heart, go Shangri-La, and then summon the Rise Heart. Then you Imperm Rise Heart. And so this is really cool because then it stays a level 4. It does banish for cost though, so they're still going to banish Big Bang, which is going to allow them to re-summon the Unicorn of the Fenrir. So this is really important though, because you did banish a card, so it does trigger the Shangri-La, which then allows you to go ahead and use the Rise Heart to make the Arise Heart, and then you still have Unicorn or Fenrir, so the board would still be Shangri-La, the Fenrir, and the Arise Heart, and then if you have the Tierlands Cashier or the extra extender like a Birth, then you're still going to be allowed to make the Mind Hacker as well. So you're putting your opponent on, you don't have extender, and then you don't get mind hackered if they don't have the extender, if you Imperm or Valor the Rise Heart. If you Imperm or Valor the Unicorn, there is a chance that they just pass. So there's a lot of 50-50 going on with this one, and there's a really good side and a really bad side to using both of these interactions. But I don't think that one is more correct than the other. I think that if I'm going to a tournament tomorrow and this was my situation, I think I would just Imperm or Valor the Unicorn, honestly, and just put my opponent on better habit. If you wait for the Rise Heart, still having to deal with a Fenrir and a Rise Heart and a Shangri-La is a lot. And that's something where if your opponent has like any kind of back row, any kind of hand traps, there's still a lot of things that you got to consider and still play through. So it's something that you kind of have to make that judgment call when you're playing against the deck. But these are going to be the major points of interaction for Imperm or Valor. You can just hold Imperm for your turn and hit the Arise Heart, which is fine too. Uh, but I think as far as trying to stop the combo, that this would be the most impactful situation. Uh, moving on to Branded. So there's a lot to talk about with Branded right now, actually. There's a lot going on. And they just got a lot of new cards, too. So Valor Imperm on the Aluber is still going to be correct. If your opponent goes draw phase and they opening summon Aluber, then, of course, it's just a little unfortunate. And you probably just save the Valor for, like, an Albion. Using the Bishuls or, like, a Crow. The one on the right here is something that you just need to hold your Bishul or Crow for because it's a quick effect to summon itself or Fallen of Albaz to the field from the graveyard. So once this is used, it says while they're both still there. So you can chain a Bishul or Crow to this card and then banish either. And then you can go ahead and just stop the effect altogether, which is really important. One thing that you want to use before is the one on the left here, the Finale Dragon. 
this is a card that if your opponent activates a monster effect that includes the effect to like special summon a monster, you're allowed to go ahead and summon a Dogmatica from deck or a Despia from the extra deck. So before you even make a play, you want to make sure that you Bishul or Crow this before it can even try to resolve. Because this card only happens after the summon is complete. So the one on the left, you want to make sure that before you do anything, you just Crow or Bishul this. The one on the right, you want to hold it until they use the effect of it. So that's something really important to note. Um, and then looking at Branded and Red and Expulsion, use cards like the Bishul's Crow or Ghost Bell on these cards. Expulsion can summon from the Banish Zone, but usually they're going to try to summon things like Ra's Disciple or Scythe from their Graveyard. So this is something that's really useful as well to go ahead and just chain a Crow or the Magnemut because it has to summon that exact card. So if you do Banish like a Scythe, they no longer can summon that Scythe. So that's really important to note too. So using the Bells, Magnemuts, any of the Bishuls, Crow on Branded and Red targets and the Expulsion, or even the Finale Dragon or the one on the right here, I think is all going to be very correct. And then also just Ashing Branded Fusion, of course, it's always going to be correct. And then looking more so at other interactions that are really important, I think with a lot of the new Branded support that's coming out, that you should always just go ahead and Ogre the Beast, but you can also just go ahead and Ogre the Continuous Spell too. That card's really good just for the grind game in general, but I think that using Ogre on the Branded Beast is still just going to be more correct. Also, looking at the Albion and the Lubellion in the graveyard, you can go ahead and just banish those as well if your opponent doesn't have the Finale Dragon or the other fusion. But using these against these two cards, again, just preemptively use these on the Lubellion because the Lubellion doesn't activate the summon. And then if your opponent does have Albion in the graveyard, make sure that you are using Meister or Ash on the Albion. Just a lot of free advantage that you really don't want to go through. So this is also just going to be another solid point of interaction. Looking at Runic Naturia, this is a deck that I've seen quite a bit and it's been more popular recently. Using Bell and Blessing is just a card that you really want to stop. This is something, again, that doesn't target to summon. It's pretty crazy, a lot of very free advantage, especially if your opponent is trying to dodge something like a call by. It's just a really solid card in general. Looking at Meister, Meister on the Mole Cricket or even the Tree Search is usually pretty important too, just because of the fact that you can go ahead and get away with just stopping so much advantage. The Mole Cricket alone being able to summon and then be able to tribute itself and summon two from the deck if your opponent has the highest attack is pretty crazy there's a lot of things that you can summon but more importantly i think the best interactions in the deck is using bell or ash on the draws you get from fountain or you can go ahead and bell the mole cricket in the graveyard as well bell is just such a solid card it's very good next format i think that it's a card that has just been overlooked for a couple formats now and it's something that just recently has really been a staple in the sideboard at three and it's something that a lot of people just really don't expect another card that's really insane against this deck is Kurakara because it doesn't activate so if your opponent uses sunflower to go ahead and stop anything then you can go ahead and just tribute it off with the Kurakara. you can just get so much value with Kurakara against this deck it's actually so crazy i played against this deck quite a few times and i think more often than not kurakara wins me the game so definitely a card that you want to make sure you have a play set up for next format especially against cash tira looking at the last interaction here though using ghost ogre to just make sure that camilla gets off the board or just going ahead and using Baylor or imperm on camilla is also just gonna be really important this is a card that's just so insane makes it to the point when you just have to mill cards to use your effects and you get a free summon back to the board it's a foolish burial this card does everything that you want especially the fact that it's a tutor is insane so this is definitely one of the craziest support cards for this deck that it could have gotten honestly uh but using the ogre Baylor imperm on this is going to be absolutely the best thing that you can do Moving on to Sword Soul, this is a deck that we saw get two spots at YCS Sydney, so I do want to just cover this again real fast to make sure that everyone's on the same page on how to stop this deck. So whenever you see your opponent go for the Boxia play, typically the play line is summoning the Taya, and then you can go into Boxia, sending the Moyi, and then the Boxia will bring back the Moyi. So this is something that you definitely want to go ahead and bell. It's a very important interaction that you really want to stop, and it really just stops your opponent from being able to draw and search, and it's just a really nice interaction here. Using the bishuls or even crow on the tenies are really insane being able to just bishul the ashuna or like a vishuda is crazy comes up a lot 
And then also having things like Baylor or Imperm on the Mo Yi, this is just another Eglin situation because the cards like Circle, you better have it. And then also using Ash on cards like Pot of Desires. I feel like a lot of people forgot about Desires. It's still a really crazy card and says draw two that Sword Soul definitely plays. So back when we were playing against a lot of Sword Soul, typically you just held Ash for the Desires. You can hit the Emergence, it's like okay. But at the same point, I'm probably just holding it for Desires because either this is the first thing to activate or the last thing. Usually if it's the last thing, Desires is trying to draw into rivalry. So this is something else that you just really want to go ahead and stop to make sure that your opponent doesn't get more advantage. Looking at the the next deck here we have Draco Slayer. Draco Slayer is a deck that's really popular. Honestly, it's just a really cool deck in general. So I think this is something that we definitely want to cover here. Using Ogre on Luster Effect is going to be really solid too. Just not allowing your opponent to get a lot of free advantage. Bistrals on the effect of Heretic when it treats itself for cost so they cannot summon from deck is insane. This is something that really does stop your opponent from being able to summon the Sloth from deck. So this is something that I really recommend doing. If your opponent has Heretic Seal, you wait for them to use the effect to tribute itself for cost, and then you Bishul it, and it gets moved to a new location before it can try to summon from deck, which is insane. So this is an interaction you really got to know. And then if you have Ash, Valor, Imperm, you can go ahead and just use all of these on the Majesty if you're afraid of Necro Valley because this is a card that can really be a problem. If you're playing like Flanderies and you have Ash or any of these cards, you really want to make sure that you are stopping this because it would allow your opponent to get the Zombie World. So if you're playing like Tyr or Flanderies, this is going to be the card you absolutely have to stop. If you are in a good situation, you don't really care too much about a field spell, hit the Ignister because you want to make sure that your opponent can't really extend. If you have two, then you can go ahead and just Valor Imperm the Beyond. Another really solid interaction here. The deck itself, again, it's very fun, but it's something that you don't really play against a ton of, but I do want to make sure that when you do, you know exactly where to hand trap. So on the last deck here, Madolche, this is a deck that we have been seeing pop up here and there. I really want to make sure that we just cover this one real quick. If your opponent summons Who Cake, you want to make sure that you banish their target with Who Cake with Crow. If you have Bell or Ash, you want to make sure that you stop the effect of the duck. Also, if you have Bell, you really want to make sure that you're stopping the effect of the Shizu Shufflebacks in the graveyard so you can at least play the game, especially if you're playing a deck like Striker and you really need cards in your graveyard, just hold the bell for the Shizu Shuffleback. It's usually going to be your best option, but you also can just bell the duck, which is equally very good because this card's insane. So another thing too is that you want to Valor Imperm the Petting Sasaur or the Angeli. Both of these cards are really insane, allowing you to special summon from the deck. Always going to be a really solid effect. Make sure that you are Imperm or Valoring these effects. So I do hope that you enjoyed today's video. There's so many different things to cover for this format and so many different points of interaction that I hope that each one of these really did help you out in some way, shape, or form next format. And definitely let me know if you learned something new down below. If you haven't already joined my Discord, Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, definitely go ahead and do so all down in the description below. And if you want a coaching session over at Medify, definitely go ahead and check out my page. And if you have any questions, feel free to PM me on Discord. I hope that everyone has a wonderful day and I'll catch you all in the next video. Thank you.